Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host Dr. Reed Robison and I give a trip report from the 2021 Horizons Perspectives on Psychedelics Conference. We attended that conference in New York City, got back a few weeks ago. This conference is the largest and longest running annual conference of the psychedelic medicine and research community in the world. I think this was their 14th annual conference. They skipped last year. We got to listen to leaders in the research, business, and medicine fields of psychedelics, and um, you could really feel the excitement about the potential for psychedelic medicine in the room. We're at a, a very exciting and interesting inflection point in history with psychedelics right now, so this year's conference was especially electric. Before we get into it, as is customary, I'm going to ask you to rate our podcast, like and subscribe on YouTube, share it with a friend whom you think might benefit from it. Those things help us out a lot. Without further delay, enjoy the show. Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. Good afternoon. It's good to see you, Reed. Likewise. We are going to talk today about um, the Horizons Conference. So myself, you, our chief scientific officer, Dr. Paul Thielking, and our CEO, Yaron Conforti. Is that you say his last mm-hmm. name? Um, we all went out there to Horizons in New York City. Perspectives on psychedelics. How long yeah. has Horizons been going on? Do you know? I don't know. Like a I don't know or something. the answer to that. One of the longest running, though, yeah. that I'm aware of. Yeah, very different than uh, Meet Delic, the, <laughs> yeah. the conference <laughs> in Vegas that we went to a month or so ago. If uh, Meet Delic was the circus, then Horizons was like university or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it was more academic, yeah. definitely, which was nice. Academic and business. They had entire days devoted to, um, you know, psychedelics and business and then, uh, days more devoted to the medicine side of things. And yeah. I love the conference and I, I mean, I should add the disclaimer that I quite like academic and university. So right. it was not in any way putting down the conference. Not it was, it was, it was a great trip. Yeah. I mean, you spent a long time in school, Reed, so uh, you must like academics to some extent. And you're a researcher. Uh-huh. You're a clinician scientist. I had to tap out at the end. I was just stuck in this eternal loop of graduate degrees where mm. I had almost added a PhD to the MD and MBA. Oh, and I was like, wait a second. Why am I doing this? <laughs> Why would this be in my life? I had to uh, insert a dose of awareness. And I was like, actually, we're not going to do that. We're not going to finish that one. (laughs) Yeah. I remember seeing this funny cartoon when I was in grad school. It was like a a New Yorker cartoon or something. And it had this, all these people in in their cap and gown uh, on this path. And then there was a a fork in the path with a sign and one arrow said real life. And the other said graduate school and everyone was going to graduate school. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's the great uh, time out. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and sometimes I got to admit, I'm a little suspicious when I see a cluster of acronyms after a person's name when they have like five or six. Am I using that word right? Acronyms. Mm-hmm. Um, like who hurt you? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or like, what do some of these mean? Like I wonder, I mean, some there's the obvious ones, MD, MBA, PhD, whatever. But then there's some that like you wouldn't recognize. There's one for like certified group psychotherapist or whatever. And sometimes you wonder like, Wait, were you were you compensating for something? Is there is there a fundamental insecurity, or maybe maybe hey, maybe I'm insecure, and that's <laughs> that's why I have this reaction to people's many acronyms. Your PhD doesn't feel like enough sometimes. It doesn't, you know. I, I remember when I was in the Air Force, we had <laughs> some of the gentlemen I worked with, um, some enlisted folks. They had uh, they used to tease me about only having what do they say two and a half letters. As part of my uh, acronym, and they had these long acronyms. Mine wasn't uh, wasn't worthy. You know, I just want to poke fun at doctors for a moment because <laughs> what you're describing of that uh, kind of you know slew of acronyms after an MD or a bunch of degrees, it could be like a uh, fellow of the American College of OBGYN or something mm-hmm. like that, mm-hmm. and there could be multiple. But uh, I think. Uh, doctors in general uh, could use a dose of 
humility into the <laughs> equation? Because one of my pet peeves is that when uh, doctors insist on being called doctor, like at mm. at a place where it's not warranted, like the valet at a hotel. Right, <laughs> I've right. seen that. I was like, dude, please don't. You're you're giving us all a bad name by by trying to throw that that around as weight or cred. Yeah, can I get your bag, Mr. Robinson? Uh, <laughs> excuse me. It's Dr. Ross, <laughs> MD, PhD, or yeah. M- MBA, <laughs> almost the PhD. Well, yeah, plenty of people with acronyms at the Horizons Conference, and thank the Lord, because these are the people that are uh, ushering in psychedelic mm-hmm. medicine into, uh, into the world. And again, what's beautiful about the psychedelic field, in my opinion, is even at one of the more academic conferences in psychedelics, the letters behind your name don't matter. We were right. all there uh, on this collective journey of, of uh, exploring these substances, um, bringing them back into healthcare and into other ways too, celebrating the, the indigenous roots, the ceremonial uses, and, and uh, you know, honoring the cultures that brought these forward. Yeah. Um, so it was, again, a multidisciplinary showing up of like-minded uh, visionaries. Like-minded, and th- it, um, the conference wasn't without some of its, some heated discussion around things like that. Oh, and yeah. some debate and disagreement. Good debate, yeah. Yeah, healthy debate, I think. Because like you said, it's, uh, this is an industry, if we're going to call it an industry, this is a movement, this is a people who are very, very diverse in the way that they are trying to bring psychedelics to the people. We have this modern Western medical system that we want to work with to make sure we Mm -hmm. deliver psychedelic medicines to as many people as we can. But understandably, there are people who um, are cautious, cautious about the commercialization of psychedelics, cautious about um, cultural appropriation, cautious about losing some of the, the... ceremony and the sacredness for a lot of these mm-hmm. plant medicines as we try to shoehorn them into a doctor's office. I remember one of the speakers, I think it was uh, the gal who spoke about community and psychedelics mm-hmm. and the power of group and psychedelics who, who said something like the way that we study these things in clinical trials is not the way they're most often used. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Because, you know, when we're doing a clinical trial, we ha- we're trying to control for variables, right? We mm-hmm. want to whittle away all yeah. these confounding variables, and sometimes that means you have a very sterile research environment, yeah. you know, trial environment. Yeah, and, and it's done for a reason, of right. course. It's hard to know what is doing what when there are multiple forces at play. Lots of noise in the signal, yeah. But that creates a challenge when things enter the real world, Um because the real world is different than the clinical trial world. Mm-hmm. It's just how it works, and it's a challenge I think we're well aware of and, and is especially true in psychedelic medicine. Yeah. Well, we'll we are well aware of it, certainly at Nova Mind. Um, it was nice to see that MAPS is well aware of it. Yeah. I really enjoyed the talk by the Public Benefit Corporation's head. Was it Amy Emerson? Or, uh, yeah. Shoot, I forget Amy, the, yeah, Amy Emerson and then Joyce Sun Cooper. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about how MDMA assisted psychotherapy is actually going to look in the yeah. wild. That was great. I really appreciated it because I felt like it was, you know, they're addressing the questions that at least all us clinicians certainly have. We see the exciting results of the phase three clinical trials, but then we look at the MDMA assisted psychotherapy manual for PTSD, and it's based on the, you know, the clinical trial approach. And um, I got to admit, it's, it's hard to see how this is, that particular treatment approach is going to be practical in a clinical setting. How are we going to train enough therapists? How are we going to get the medicine? And they tried to address, um, they tried to address those things. And they had some goals, right? Some predictions. Yeah, it might be worth highlighting some of those because there's this great timeline update slide or two uh, with an estimated approval timeline for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD by the FDA before 2023 is over. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, this has been slowed down by the real world and the pandemic and things like that. But uh, 
it's forging ahead. The data is striking, as we've talked about on here. And Maps mentioned a really fascinating goal or two. One is to train 30,000 therapists by 2031 and to deliver MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to 1 million people by, with PTSD by 2031. So that's the, the eight-year post-approval window. Yeah. And imagine if, if um, the success rate that they're seeing in the trial uh, holds over to real-world application. You've got you know, close to 70% of those million people with PTSD who no longer meet diagnostic criteria for PTSD. It's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, some other things from the MAPS update I thought were interesting. There was a lot of discussion around the REMS system or the REMS part of the equation. So REMS meaning risk evaluation and management system that we're very familiar with around here because we give Spravato. And Spravato is governed by a REMS. A REMS is put in place by the FDA when there's when they consider there's a special risk around a medicine. Uh, in this case, MDMA being a Schedule One, and uh, one of the big reasons is to prevent diversion, misuse, mm -hmm. abuse, and so uh, that is is pretty well known, um, pretty well established that it will be coming along with the approval. But we could have guessed that already, and therefore, it will just be given for PTSD initially, right. like not really available for off-label use. They wouldn't comment on off-label use, but but from our experience uh, with Spravato, you can give it to someone with the indication it's approved for. They can have other things too. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes there are some severity measures put forth on that, like a certain severity of PTSD. But Michael Mitoffer even said he doesn't know that, he doesn't think CAPS score will be an absolute cutoff or at least part of the approval, and I right. agree. Right. Yeah, there were some questions from the audience about uh, therapy being included in the REMS. Um, not just that psychotherapy would need to be part of the treatment protocol, but like what kind of psychotherapy, how detailed would the REMS get? Would it say something like you would, you know, you need to do so many sessions and they need to be IFS or they need to be CT yeah. or something like that? Well, I think we, we know the answer to that already because therapy, this is the first medicine that's being evaluated as both a, a medicine plus therapy combination for a given indication right. and we know from maps training maps collaborations the maps uh, therapist manual they've publicly shared um, that we know that the therapy is this non-directive approach that we're familiar with um, so they don't think there will be any curveballs there but I think the REMS will require people working closely with the medicine at least the prescriber I'm pretty certain the therapists, uh, I would imagine as well, mm -hmm. would need to be uh, registered in this system and document their training. And do you think it'll be therapy dyads? Do you think in the Rams it'll, that you'll have to have two therapists? Yeah. So it's it's hard to it's hard to imagine it not being. I don't remember this being discussed there. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious what Maps would say to this question. But my opinion is the clinical trials were done that way. And therefore, it will be approved that way, but then reevaluated after approval. And MAPS is certainly like picking their battles at this stage to ensure a smooth course towards approval. Mm -hmm. um, because, like I said, those can be worked on after somewhat. Um, so, yeah, I would, uh, I would guess that's going to be the case. They did clarify, though, that the prescribers of MDMA who might just be down the hall. Say there's two therapists in a dyad sitting for a client who's taking MDMA. The prescriber might just oversee the giving of the medicine or check their vitals before, things like that. And they won't need this uh, dozens of hours of therapist training. Mm -hmm. um, they might need an hour or a few hours of prescriber training which is also familiar to us because right. as medical mer medical cannabis prescribers in Utah, for example, uh, you take a course for a few hours. Which is a relief because that would be a huge bottleneck if a bunch of MDs and mm -hmm. MPs and PAs had to go through hour hundreds of hours of training. And I remember them using the, the words on site, and I can't remember if they were if they were saying that the 
the medical personnel, this so the prescriber, didn't have to be on site? That's been an ongoing debate. Um, <clears throat> even in the eating disorder protocol that I worked on with MAPS, uh, it's, it's a debate with the FDA mm-hmm. and sometimes Health Canada. Uh, every clinical trial that goes through this process for MDMA, um, as MAPS rightly so, pushes for less and less unnecessary restrictions. Right. And the FDA gradually says, okay, like yeah. um, not needing to stay overnight after your MDMA that uh, was the case in the early, early studies, right. for example. Yeah, and these early studies sort of are setting the template for other psychedelic yeah. medicines. You know, as you see psilocybin protocols that require two therapists to be present. Yeah, and we can, again, look at some recent approvals like Spravato or esketamine approved in 2019 for treatment-resistant depression. Because the studies were done... Uh, as bravado being added on to uh, an antidepressant, a new or optimized, uh, it's approved that way. It doesn't mean we have to give it that way in the real world. Um, Some insurance companies will ask now, and then they'll be like, did you start the new antidepressant or whatever? Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, I think similarly, um, the approval will largely follow how the medicine's been studied. Yeah, makes sense. Um, it makes me think of the folks from Oregon who were talking about uh, the decriminalization initiative mm-hmm. for psilocybin. I'm going to look up their names real quick because I forgot. Oh, who were they? Oregon Measure 109, Thomas Eckert and Angela, Angela, Angela Alby. Mm-hmm. I loved their talk. Um, but, you know, one of, one of the points they made is that another way to get these medicines to the people is to get them in the hands of already, you know, very competent psychotherapists by decriminalizing the medicine. Yeah. Um, and you know, or they, legalizing or legalizing it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Is that what it was? Was it legalization because for therapeutic use, right? Yeah. Because decriminalization doesn't, uh, doesn't give the little old lady next door, uh, a way to go get the medicine and therapy. It right. just means if she Gets grows her own <laughs> mushrooms, she won't go to jail <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or buys it from a dealer. She, she, uh, met on Craigslist or whatever. Right. right. And of course, you know, that begs all kinds of questions about regulation of the therapy, of the therapeutic, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in an yeah. area where it's legalized, you know, there's not a, a central governing body, like, for instance, if you're a psychotherapist, if I'm a psychologist, if mm-hmm. I mistreat my client, they can report me to, to the Department of Licensing at Utah. We have a licensing department body, a credentialing body. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, that was there was some discussion around that, I think, at the conference, too. Like, who's going to be providing these credentials? And Yeah. There was a great ethics talk, too, that touched on that. And it's especially important in the realm of, of the underground and guides where... Mm-hmm. Like you said, there's no governing body, but in Oregon, there is a governing committee task force working on it that's uh, in uh, full debate right now. And all this is kind of published as minutes and even some recordings, I think, of key meetings. Um, They're debating what the required credentials are for the therapist or therapy pair. and. And uh, that's been an age-old debate, and we see that debate in the CAP world, too. Right. But in general, I know I personally fall on the side of, uh, well, accessibility. Mm-hmm. We want to figure out how to access this while maintaining a high standards of safety. And also while recognizing that we as a healthcare system did not invent psychedelics. We do not own <laughs> right. psychedelics. Right. And they come from this rich heritage of uh, you know, indigenous peoples and cultures across the world who have used these in uh, religious and ceremonial and uh, and uh, other practices for not just healing, but for growth and spirituality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And not, of course, not all psychedelic compounds uh, necessarily come from some kind of ancient tradition, right? You got yeah. <laughs> MDMA and LSD and... Um, you could make the argument that a lot of them are based on a fungus, on ergot or whatever. And 
Or from the operating room anesthesia. Yeah, ketamine. <laughs> or horse tranquilizer uh, <laughs> compounds. But I think, you know, just because of the kinds of people who've been trying to usher this stuff forward, you see uh, a lot of the same strategies and containers that um, for facilitating a psychedelic journey that you might find in a traditional, um, uh, like you were describing, for thousands of years uh, context where you see them trying to be ported into or translated into the regular medical establishment struggling with yeah. the words but and and I see no problem with that personally if done ethically responsibly appropriately look give at, credit where credit's due yeah like look at ibogaine as an example or iboga yeah. where the plant it comes from um it it's used and has been used for a very long time in kind of ceremonial practices in parts of Africa. And it was discovered that Ibogaine is a potent anti-addictive psychedelic. Um, and there were a lot of discussions at Horizon about how to honor that. Like, should even some of the proceeds from the development of this into a drug presuming that happens one day because some people are working on it should that be reinvested to the communities where it came from i mean that would yeah. certainly make sense um or be a good move by whoever's working on it uh, yeah yeah lots of cool ideas like that we're talking oh, about yeah. the conference yeah and uh related to the maps one um on day one at least um around around the time of of the initial maps talks, uh, Leah Mix, uh, founder of Anthea, mm -hmm. a nonprofit psychedelic insurance company, spoke and and shared some really interesting thoughts about um, about what it'll take to enable access to this in the healthcare system, given the current state of the insurance industry. And then she makes some points that you know, not only will we need to bend and flex, but the insurance industry and the medical establishment will need to bend and flex. Yeah. Yeah. She said she also often gets asked the question, um, what it, I have it in my notes here. Uh, she said the most common questions I get asked about insurance coverage of psychedelic therapies are if and when it will get covered. These are the wrong questions because it relies too heavily on a system that hasn't figured out access for standard healthcare treatments. Amen. And I, uh, I really like and respect Leah Mix a lot. Um, and I've been impressed with her since my first ever Zoom call with her back last year sometime. Um, and as a disclaimer, I am on their ketamine advisory board for this nonprofit insurance company. But my shout out is uh, completely sincere. I think uh, she, she was shining a light on some really important um, potential obstacles ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it made me think of the other quote that I had in my notes from Nicole Howell. Um, Psychedelic Bar Association North Star Project. Yeah. She... Um, the North Star Pledge. She says that she makes a strong case for asking not how do we make psychedelics more mainstream, but how do we make mainstream more psychedelic? I love that quote. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was great. How do we make mainstream more psychedelic? Sprinkle psychedelics everywhere. Oh, by the way, in a recent episode... <laughs> the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. In a recent episode, we were talking about Humphrey Osmond, Aldous Huxley. Yeah. And I didn't even try to ask, uh, draw it from my memory banks during, but we were trying to remember the poem that that yeah, uh, the, they were the reciting. Yeah. Uh, but then it came to me immediately when we finished that episode. It was like to fathom hell or soar angelic, take a pinch of psychedelic. There you go. Um, and I could wish I could remember uh, Huxley's re retort because it was, you know, it rhymed with Phanerothym. Yeah. Something, something sublime. I think that was the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway, that's a tangent. <laughs> but <laughs> I love uh, tangents, Reed. That's uh, what this podcast is all about. Yeah, they're allowable. They're allowable. Um, All is allowed. No rules. No rules mm -hmm. here on the Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers Although, podcast. Although, you know, not to throw my mother under the bus, but she, oh. she, she might be listening to this. She might not. I was in a conversation with her the other day, and 
we're, I, uh, we're, we're talking about the podcast and she said, you know, I can't recommend your podcast to my friends because Steve, you swear on your podcast. Speaking of rules. Yes. Shit. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, Reed, not me. Um, what happened next? Um, um, how I said, did you respond? <laughs> I said, I understand. I also mm-hmm. said, I don't care. And then I sort of <gasps> backed up because I, I do care. I mean, I want people oh. to, to listen to the content we have on this podcast and not be offended. I, I desire that for them. That being said, um, authenticity and being genuine are really important values mm-hmm. to me. And so if I want to say shit, I'm going to say shit. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's a tragedy that people in today's day and age feel okay using foul language in a public forum. Um, I don't, I don't really mind personally. <laughs> maybe it, it's a generational thing. I don't know. Yeah. I think it is somewhat a generational thing because I'm still blown away by what, uh, the content of Netflix and other platforms mm-hmm. and TV MA, like what's that thing people are into right now? I've never seen it. Squid games. Yeah. But I saw the, like half of the first episode. There's some shocking, gory, graphic uh-huh. things out there. I know that's different than swear words. Sure. Uh, but, but I think, uh, what is, what was taboo years ago, decades ago, especially is, uh, much more commonplace these days in terms of, uh, like rated R content. Yeah. Yeah. And it's certainly cultural, you know, you go to other countries and there's, uh, billboards with completely topless women on them advertising bras or something like that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what is considered filthy is, uh, it's a social construction, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of having this conversation with my kids. I have three sons and, um, you know, they may or may not have heard me swear on occasion. And, uh, I, I don't want them running around swearing like sailors, but I also don't want them to feel ashamed or guilty if a swear word slips out. Mm. A lot of the media that they consume has swear words in it, of course, uh, I'm not showing them a bunch of rated R movies or anything, but they're YouTubers that they watch. You know, they'll say yeah. a few swears. And then when they're playing video games online, they'll hear plenty of that content. They're going to um, get exposed. <laughs> they're going to get exposed. And because I don't want them to feel ashamed, because I don't think it's a shame worthy, it's something to feel ashamed about to mm-hmm. say a swear word. Um, it's it's a weird nuanced conversation to have with like an eight-year-old, for example, my eight-year-old. Mm-hmm who he's, he's interested by swear words. He thinks they're interesting and powerful and funny, but he's also, you know, he, he knows that they're a little taboo and that he sh- quote unquote shouldn't say them. It's difficult territory to navigate, especially cause you know, it's my story about my mom suggests I grew up uh, being told you shouldn't swear. <laughs> yeah. Even though my father who was born in 1929, um, would occasionally swear when a fish got off the line or I remember one time I was camping, me and my buddy were in our hammocks and we heard some rustling in the bushes and, and also we hear like a twig snap and damn it. It was my dad who (laughs) was coming to check on us and he got uh, tripped up by a twig. Scandalous. I know. How dare he? Well, we'll see if our mothers heard me swear on this episode. (laughs) I'll probably get a text (laughs) later. Back to the task at hand. So one more thought on Leah's talk about psychedelic insurance coverage. Um, She said something like, if you're a business or a drug development company in this space, you might want to pay attention to the infrastructure needed because what we were just talking about with the MAPS path forward, um, that's a paradigm shift for mental health care where you come into the office and take a pill and go on a journey for six hours while say two therapists hold space and then you do a bunch of integration in that window of neuroplasticity afterwards um and so it it made me think of well what we're up to here building clinics and working with uh ketamine because we love working with ketamine and powerful medicine and because it also helps pave the way for this stuff it also made me think of Elon Musk and how, like when, when uh, the Tesla automobiles came out, there was a big question of can people charge them? Can people go on a road trip? And he had the foresight of putting these supercharging stations sprinkled around or building the infrastructure so it could roll out. 
Yeah, and we've had some developments here with respect to ketamine that were great. We've gotten a couple of insurance companies in Utah to yeah. cover IV ketamine. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> it's another interesting thing from that same talk is uh, decisions about care aren't always evidence-based or even made by the medical providers. Sometimes they're made by insurance companies of with different intentions. Right. And she pointed out how 90% of the U.S. is insured by some kind of health coverage. It's about half, like, government, what was it, half yeah. government, half Employer. private. Um, and uh, with all these, if you slice that up further, you have all these different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And we see that when we go for approval of whether it's ketamine or spravato or group therapy or uh, having someone or, yeah, yeah. do an IOP program or say we want to get neuropsych testing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's often made by a committee of people with a lot of economics in mind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's a fair criticism of the U S healthcare system that a lot of those decisions aren't made between you and your doctor. They're made, you know, but decisions about what will be covered. You know, I've got, I know people, so my, my, uh, well, I know people who have serious medical conditions, let's put it that way, just to be vague, protect mm -hmm. privacy, um, who will go and, and get a medicine treatment for that medical condition. And the medicine the doctor wants to put them on is not the medicine that they can start them on. They have to start them on yeah. a different medicine first. And you have to, quote unquote, fail that medicine, which I hate that phrase. It's like, you don't fail the medicine, the treatment medicine fails failure. you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, and then after you've failed that one, maybe you can do the other two that you have to break through to get to the medicine the mm -hmm. doctor actually wants to give you. And it's kind of ridiculous. I have played that game more times than I can count. Yeah. And it's in fact part of treatment planning, a necessary evil that comes up um, kind of like a chess match. You almost need to anticipate your, your future moves uh, when faced with infinite decisions. It sometimes helps narrow it down. Let's, um, do a course of this medicine plus this therapy on the path to uh, wellness right. because, you know, we might need to document treatment failure um, to get out the big guns if mm -hmm. needed, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a course of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy that is not trivial in its cost or accessibility, right. at least now. Well, not trivial in its cost or accessibility, but also in, um, well, it's a big gun, like you just said. Not everyone who is depressed is going to need psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, right? Yeah. Um, and not that it only has to be a medicine, like we've referenced before. A lot of peoples on this planet have been using psychedelics for just personal growth, spiritual exploration, rites of passage. But it's uh, not a trivial experience mm -hmm. to you know, be tossed through, you know, down the stairs of your, your consciousness into the cellar <laughs> for six hours at a time. Yeah. That, uh, reminds me of one of my favorite talks from Horizons was by, I, I don't know how to pronounce her name. I'd never met her before this mm -hmm. event. Ghoul Dolan. Mm -hmm. I'd followed her work, uh, who talked about critical periods and psychedelics oh, yeah. and, that was a good one. and the need for integration and the need for context, meaning the right set and setting, just pointing out some of the scientific explanations for why someone heals um, differently or there's a different rate of healing in MDMA-assisted psychotherapy compared to someone taking MDMA at a rave. Right. Yeah. yeah, and the idea of critical periods, I think, comes from the child development literature. Um, yeah. The concept, at least, that there are these critical periods during your development as a human being within which you need to learn certain skills. And if you don't learn them, mm -hmm. and these skills could be emotional processing skills as much as they are learning to walk. But if you don't learn them, then it's harder, not impossible, but harder to learn them as efficiently later. You yeah. know, they, they say there's the certain critical window of neurological development within which language, it, you're most likely to be a language sponge. And then once yeah. you get past <laughs> it, it's harder to learn a second language. I've uh, been banging my head against that wall over the last decade or two, it seems, because I've always loved languages. I, you know, I used to dabble with them growing up. I was in French immersion as a kid, um, and 
therefore kind of in high school Spanish. I dabbled in a number of these Latin languages. And then I started to get more, I don't know, um, more bold with, with, with which ones I'd explore. But it wasn't until, I don't know, the last 10 years that I realized that my ability to learn languages is vastly different than it used to be. Yeah. Uh, um, especially if they're outside of the norm, like when I went to Thailand or China. Right, right. <laughs> I was yeah. out of my uh, element. <laughs> Non-Latin-based languages, yeah. Yeah, much, much, much is similar, like... Um, how well I can touch my toes <laughs> now mm-hmm. that I'm an adult. As we age, things kind of become less flexible. Cognition and hamstrings a lot. <laughs> so psychedelics, this is another tangent, but um, psychedelics may very well open up a critical period of stretchiness mm-hmm. or uh, flexibility in not just the mind. I remember reading the story of Andrew Weil, mm. an essay he wrote about his early LSD experiences. He's the integrative functional medicine pioneer from the like Weill, Cornell, integrative health stuff. Strong Uh, beard game. Yeah. Yeah. He's a big teddy bear of a, of a man who I've, I've admired for a long time. And he was, uh, in the era of, uh, you know, Paul Stamets and Ram Dass, then Dick Alpert and all of them. He was a little bit behind, uh, Ram Dass and Tim Leary at Harvard, but he was there and he was, exploring psychedelics and I remember reading about um, him getting into a yoga practice and he was trying to do this uh, pose called plow pose Mm. Uh, do you know what shoulder stand is where you're on your back your feet are in the sky if your feet are in the sky and then you bring them back behind your head to touch the ground behind you that's plow and you went too far you'd knee yourself in the face mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah And actually, there's another pose. This is a tangent on a tangent, but <laughs> another pose called ear pressure pose or karna pidasana, where you bend your knees, you squeeze your ears, and your feet and knees are still on the ground. That one's tough. Uh, <laughs> that makes me wonder why you would ever want to do that, Reed. That mm. sounds like a torture. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole I other... I won't force you to explain. A yeah. whole other question, but yeah. back to Andy Weil. He's trying to do plow pose and can't mm. because... You know, it's a little beyond touching his toes, but, um, and then he takes LSD one day and he can do it. Yeah. And he's like, what the? And the next day he can't. Um, so he takes LSD again and he can do it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it must be possible. So then he proceeded to practice more and was able to do it off LSD. (laughs) I love that story because it is a great metaphor for what we're doing in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy a lot of the time. Yeah. On the medicine, it shows you what's possible, maybe emotionally, maybe psychologically, yeah. especially if you have one of those euphoric trips or experiences. Mm-hmm. Or take MDMA to feel that sense of love and safety and connection. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't last forever. And so you go back and you can't do plow pose anymore. But you know what's possible, and that gives you the hope to mm-hmm. work toward being able to do it outside of the medicine experience. Yeah, I, uh, I really like that. And it reminds me of something Matt Johnson said uh, in one of his talks. I know he spoke about addiction. He's the researcher at Hopkins who was awarded the first NIH grant for psychedelic studies um, yeah. on his uh, smoking cessation grant recently. The government's finally um, paying for psychedelic mm-hmm. research again. Congrats. Yeah. And so he said something about what he loves about this field is that it's it's not automatic. Uh, healing is people doing the work. Mm. You know, the medicine facilitates the process, but it's still people doing their own healing. Yeah, I have uh, Dr. Nicole LaPera's book, How to Do the Work, strategically positioned in my office so I can point to it sometimes for therapy clients. Do you know, we'll, your homework. Yeah, like we've well, had this really cool experience on ketamine. Now it's time to, and I'll point to it, do the work. Yeah. We talk about what it means. And uh, that neuroplasticity talk or the critical period talk by Dolan um, was so interesting because it, she's actually studied and begun to quantify how long this window of opportunity is for each of the psychedelics, even the non-classic ones, um, like uh, ketamine. Uh, this is spot on with what we've told people is you have this sweet spot of 
48 hours uh, of a, a window of opportunity where learning is easier, yeah. like, or where um, practices have a better chance of sticking. And then that window, not immediately, starts to close a little bit for MDMA, Two weeks, psilocybin, two weeks, LSD, four weeks, Ibogaine, was four Ibog- weeks. I thought, yeah, wasn't there one that was a lot more than the others? I thought yeah. it was Ibogaine. Yeah, so she pointed out, be careful with, well, it, be careful with what you do after Ibogaine. Yeah. It's a window of opportunity, a window of sensitivity. Vulnerability, um, you yeah. could say. Like, in fact, we were um, doing some ketamine treatment this morning with a group, and that's one of the things we talked to them about is, you know, uh, one of our clinicians was staffing a case later and he was asking about this person who right after a ketamine experience had decided he was going to leave his wife. And uh, (laughs) this clinician said, you know, whether or not you need to leave your wife is up to you. I don't know what the right decision is. What Mm -hmm. I do know is that your mind is especially plastic right now and and that maybe making huge life changes in the 48 hours after ketamine is unwise. Yeah. And cautioned him against doing so. It's a standard part of my, like, preparation session script Mm -hmm. or even, like, some of the protocols we've developed, like FCAP, um, to give people the disclaimer that, you know, you should take some time before making any big life-altering decisions after the dosing session. And it's certainly not the time to uh, go change everything right as you're coming out of a session. Like, sit with those integrate them process them um, yeah and uh don't sign any contracts or operate any heavy machinery on the day of ketamine <laughs> right yeah. yeah you have to you have to remember that your your ego the the part of your mind that is there to keep you as you've said before from getting hit by a bus um it sort of takes a back seat when you're on medicines like this and yeah. sometimes your ego is responsible for a lot of your psychedelic or excuse me psychological suffering but it's also there to protect you. So wait, yeah. wait till it comes back into the boardroom before you make any executive decisions. <laughs> That's a good point. And I should clarify that I didn't personally get hit by a bus. It's a <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. Uh, it's a metaphor from, I can't forget. It's a Zen call. teacher Zen, of yeah. uh, how much the, the question or the koan being how much ego do you need? Do you need? And yeah. we need just enough so you don't get hit by a bus. Or so we don't bump into each other, uh, step on each other's toes too much at right. least. Yeah, and dear listeners, if you are uh, interested in more thoughts, more of our thoughts on Zen and mindfulness, we had an episode with Dr. Paul Thielking where we talked a lot about that. And a phrase that's often used is, um, you know, chop wood, carry water, yeah. to, to talk about doing the work. And mm-hmm. uh, Paul and I were in casual conversation the other day, and I heard him say, chop water, carry wood. <laughs> Hey, I've I've said that. I've definitely <laughs> said that. Yeah, it's funny to think about chopping water. Yeah, but um, hey, some water needs to be chopped, and some wood needs to be carried. Yeah. So um, psychedelics are context dependent. Right. Was one thing that this researcher pointed out, and uh, did uh, so. You know, they need to be given in the right set and setting and context. Um, What I found interesting was some research she cited, I don't know if it was their lab or elsewhere, that uh, the question, and this is very scientific, and I love uh, love this about science, is like, we'll just try and poke hypotheses or theories or results and see if we can make them crumble or see if they're really true. Like, what happens if you block the 5-HD2A receptor to this two-week window of, of metaplasticity after taking psilocybin, well, you mostly block that window. Yeah. But what happens to the ketamine or MDMA window if you give a 5-HT2A blocker like ketanserin mm-hmm. as an example? Nothing. Yeah, the windows are still there, um, which um, it, it really lends weight to this idea that... Uh, this broader term for psychedelics. It's not just the classic psychedelics of, you know, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline, um, LSD. You know, we include MDMA and ketamine in those. Right. Uh, and there's probably more to come. <laughs> That's it, right? There might be more to come. Like, we could be 
I'm, there are two books that are propping up the camera right now that I'm looking at, the T. Call and Fee Call. Yeah. You know, the, there are almost infinite possibilities, I would imagine, in the kinds of psychedelics that can be uh, compounded. There's so much, we know so much about the brain, but we know so little about the brain too. And yeah. it's another reason why I'm so excited that we can actually start doing research again on psychedelics because we could have a whole new classification, a whole new receptor sites, who knows? Yeah, no, I, I'm, uh, I'm convinced there are more coming. And, you know, as clinical trialists, we know also because there are a lot of novel compounds coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Um, uh, drawing lessons from the other psychedelics. Um, and those books, uh, TCAL and PCAL, yeah, PCAL. Uh, they're a good example of this is one chemist, uh, Alexander Shulgin, mm-hmm. who systematically like synthesized, made up in, in a number of instances and documented, you know, how to make a whole slew of psychedelic compounds and what they feel like <laughs> his own trip report just fascinating. Yeah. And if, so if, if he was able to, with his, uh, with his partner in crime, his wife and his, his buddies at Esalen and from the psychedelic community back then, if they were able to explore so much, um, think about what's possible in this new wave, this Renaissance. It also says a lot for what we can do for preservation. Um, I didn't get to hear his talk, but I ran into Hamilton Morris and had a brief conversation with him about yeah. um, and a selfie in which he looked unhappy to be taking the picture. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty funny. Posted it on Instagram. Um, but I talked to him a little bit about 5-MeO-DMT and the Sonoran Desert Toad and his kind of quest to educate people that 5-MeO is pretty easy to synthesize in the lab. And when you do that, you don't have to milk toads and disrupt the ecosystem and harm these animals. And he was also talking to me about uh, ayahuasca. And because since ayahuasca has become much more popular, that uh, you're finding unethical harvesting practices that, uh, yeah. and I, I began the same way. Mushrooms, fun, you know, fungus is a little bit easier to grow. Um, but I remember even hearing that Paul Stamets got a little upset because Michael Pollan um, sort of described in yeah. his book, How to Change Your Mind, the location. He didn't give like geo coordinates or anything where Paul likes to harvest. But and the then internet figures it they out. They figured it out yeah. and now you have to find a new spot. But yeah. Yeah. Like, so not only are we going to create novel compounds in the lab, but we can, we can synthesize compounds and there's debate. Of course, there are yeah. people who will say that you take the soul out of the medicine when you remove the plant matter and things like that. Or I, I did along those lines, I asked Hamilton if there were any other alkaloids in, you know, the five MEO you would get from the toad, the bufo alivarius, or however you say it. Yeah. And he said there's bufotanine. I'm probably mispronouncing these things. Um, but he thinks it's not integral to the psychedelic experience. And uh, in true Hamilton Morris fashion, he isolated it and took it by itself. And yep, he said it just would. made him sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like uh, Amanita or something like that, perhaps. Right. Um, right. But uh, there was a Hamilton quote that I liked, and I have in my notes here, um, cause he set out in his documentaries, Hamilton's pharmacopoeia mm-hmm. to answer the question, where do drugs come from? And he said, you know, instead of what some might think like drugs coming from money hungry, evil drug pushers, he found that drugs actually come from people who are risking their freedom. These kind of drugs, psychedelic right. drugs come from people who are risking their freedom out of an idealistic love of psychedelics and a belief that making them and distributing them would make the world a better place. Yeah, you don't see that kind of motive from a Mexican drug cartel. That's incredible. I like that quote. Yeah. Yeah, and you do that is a, a palpable feature of the psychedelic community whether it's in academic circles or um or whether it's in underground circles right. of of people are really well-meaning and uh you know, and enthusiastic about these for a good reason, mm-hmm. you know, because of their potential. And, and thankfully, even though we have to pay uh, huge importance to our impact on the planet and all this, uh, psychedelics uh, do have this ability to 
to make us more aware of our impact on the planet. Yeah. Um, and so it's, uh, it's good for this discussion to come up and this community to tackle that. Absolutely. Anything else? Any other talks you thought were that stood out to you? I know Charles Raison had a couple talks that were cool, talking about the psilocybin data from the USONA Open Science. Yeah, that was uh, that was a really interesting one. I, I like he's a he's a psychopharmacologist who's uh, well known to most of us psychiatrists, uh, um, following kind of academic thought leaders, and he he gave a he gave a good summary of key depression studies with psilocybin and as we begin to do our our first uh formal psilocybin for depression studies across the across the parking lot there in our research clinic i thought it was really uh great how he put it together and pointed out how treatment resistant depression is especially tough like this is a different animal and the results that um well even major depressive disorder uh, these are complex conditions, right. and the results still are quite positive, even if some people might have expected them to be, like, completely earth-shattering or a magic bullet. Yeah, because yeah, some people were a little disappointed when the, that data came out, and it, it it wasn't like the MDMA maps data. Yeah, but um, so that data being the Compass Pathways right. recent Phase 2B announcement of their yeah. data. So it was positive, statistically significant, and as more and more uh, exploratory variables are analyzed, there's even more and more uh, kind of positive results coming from the study, and he shared some of those. But uh, that's it's a different thing to treat someone who's been uh, battling depression or treatment resistant depression for years or decades right. and tried every therapy imaginable compared to treating something else like end of life anxiety, right. smoking cessation, uh, even or a even moderate PTSD. or a moderate major depressive episode, yeah. right? These people with quote unquote treatment resistant depression, like you were alluding to, they might have a, a different thing. Yeah. We have these, we've talked about diagnosis on here before. We have these broad buckets that have these labels that we dump a lot of people into and they might not all uh, belong together <laughs> in those yeah. buckets. Yeah, depression is tricky in that regard from a research standpoint yeah. because it, it means many different things. I remember from when I was uh, immersed in autism research, just as an example, mm -hmm. um, and doing autism genetic work at the University of Utah, uh, it quickly became apparent that there wasn't just one autism or three or four or five autisms. There are hundreds of different types of autism when you're looking at it uh, neurogenetically. Yeah, interesting. And, and that, those are starting to be cataloged um, systematically by, um, you know, the, the scientific progress showing that Maybe 3% of those uh, result from a maternally inherited chromosome 15Q11 duplication, mm. just for example. Yeah. And then there's also the fragile X syndrome that makes up a little percent. And this other gene, this other gene, this, these environmental factors, um, and things like depression, ADHD, uh, anxiety, similarly complex. Right. Yeah, in the autism case, it makes you wonder if um, autism is the right word to describe all those hundreds of, mm -hmm. you know, conditions is, you know, we're calling it all autism spectrum. And that's getting better, at, at a better term, at least yeah. showing that it, you know, it's a collection of conditions. Yeah. Well, interesting. Yeah. So there was that talk. Um, anything else that jumped out at you? Those were kind of the highlights for me. Um, lots of other really good talks, just, uh, Nothing jumping to my memory. Yeah, one uh, other quote that I remember from the opening talk, I think it was Anthony Bossis, yeah. if I'm saying his name right, uh, from NYU. One of the early psilocybin researchers, he said something like, we're at our best when we're working together to heal one another and heal this very fragile planet. Yeah, it's beautiful. It was cool to see Michael and Annie Mettehofer talk about therapist training. Um, they have they have quite the uh, the cult following. <laughs> oh yeah, 
so many people have been through training with them and they're just golden hearted people. Yeah. They got a standing ovation, I think at the end of their talk, but, um, they, they are. And, and I remember when Michael got up for his talk, no slides, he's just speaking there the with heart. us connected. He, uh, yeah, he even, uh, choked up for mm-hmm. a minute in his introductory remarks and, and yeah, he's, he's got a, a big, big heart. Yeah. They talked a bit about what training would look like and answered some questions that I had about how are we going to train all these people, all these therapists that we're going to need to have on board when the medicine gets approved um, to avoid the bottleneck. It'll be a challenge, but yeah, well, we're, perhaps it's trying. we're working on it. And uh, even here in Utah, we have several people who we've kind of referred to and successfully got into the current MDMA therapy training under uh, scholarships like yeah. equity and diversity scholarships too. So we're working on this uh, this army of therapists in Utah, not just in our clinics too. These are with yeah. collaborative uh, clinics and therapy groups and solo practitioners uh, to be able to work on you know studies between now and then, but also be ready for the work when it rolls out. Excited for the work yeah. when it rolls out. Well, thanks, Reed. Hopefully we can attend many more psychedelic conferences in the future. Yeah, thank you. That was fun. It's a good trip. Yeah. Thank you, dear listener, for listening. It means a lot to me. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, suggestions, skating criticisms, etc., please email us at psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. Thanks again.